Amen. Amen. Mark Miller, thank you so much for opening our worship. Worship has indeed begun with that music, and we are so grateful. My name is Ned Allen Parker. I'm the Associate Dean for Institutional Advancement here at Andover Newton Seminary at Yale Divinity School, and I'm so happy and honored and grateful to welcome all of you here for this service. I'll also be acting as the liturgist throughout the service and introducing each of the participants when it's their time to lead their part of the service. So first, we will have our chalice lighting, which will be offered by Tara Humphreys, third year MDiv and diploma student, and also a member of our student steering committee. Tara, will you please light our chalice this morning? Good morning, everybody. I light our chalice this morning with the words of George Beach. In the mystery of life about us, there is light. It gives us a place to be, to grow, to rejoice together. It opens the pathways to love. In this place of friendship, there is freedom. Let the light we kindle go before us strong in hope, wide in goodwill, inviting the day to come. It is good to be together. Thank you so much, Tara. Again, welcome to those tuning in across the nation. We are grateful for your presence with us here today. A quick reminder to have elements ready for communion, which will come at the end of the service. So if you don't have your elements, you can go and collect them while I'm offering our brief introduction. In academic year 2021-2022, we are reflecting on the theme, emerge, gather, belong. I see this unfolding in, on three levels, what's happening on the surface, what's happening in the soil, and what rests on the bedrock. On the surface, we are beginning to emerge after 18 plus months in isolation. And as we emerge, we are gathering, kind of still masked, still social distancing, still learning more about this pandemic as it continues to unfold and being impacted by it. And after and still within all of that, we are seeking belonging, community. Now in the soil, under the surface are the questions that are growing as the days unfold. Are we truly emerging? How do we address communal trauma? Are we finally at a time when we can wrestle with and reconcile systemic racism in this nation? How is political unrest and turmoil when combined with the peculiarities of pandemic impacting our financial health and well-being, and what are we learning from the still growing disparities being coming even increasingly evident among us? What have we learned about gathering during the pandemic? While some experience Zoom fatigue, others are finding community, particularly in churches, more accessible in ways it's never been accessible before. What have we learned as a result of this? And what does it mean to belong in a bifurcated national and global climate when binaries are the norm? Finally, we get down to the bedrock, which at Andover Newton, are contemplating through the lens of the Gospels. The Gospels describe Jesus emerging from the tomb, the disciples gathering to tell their individual and collective stories about that experience. And from that, a church birthed that has provided belonging 
of various shapes and kinds for two millennia. So today we hold these things together, recognizing a spirit that transcends monitors and cell phone screens, allowing us to worship as one body, the beloved community of Andover Newton. Welcome. Welcome to this digital place you're invited to come and know God's grace. All are welcome. May you experience that grace today. Thank you for being here. And now, Jaquan Beecham, Andover Newton's Director of Community Development and Spiritual Formation, will offer our invocation. Jaquan. Thanks, Ned. Wild and wondrous God, Spirit of grace and compassion, fall fresh on us now. Fill the distance as we gather together across the nation far and wide. Unite us in mind and heart and spirit. Guide us as we continue to emerge into our next normals. Allow us to show up as our fullest selves here. Let us receive what we need in this moment for you know, creator. Grant us the courage to share and to care, remembering that healing can be found in grieving and relief can be found in rage. Remembering that our freedom is bound in one another, entangled in our hu humanity. Remind us that in you, we have a theology for this. Remind us that we are not alone, that we have a cloud of witnesses surrounding us here and now, presently, virtually, and ancestrally, as we travel along the road together. So come spirit, come now, convict, convert, and consecrate with us, conspire and co-create with us, as we seek to lean into your mystery, as we gather to go together with intentionality and emerge into new life tenderly, knowing that we belong and that grace abounds. May it be so, and may we make it so. Ashe and amen. We belong and grace abounds. Thank you, Jaquan. Thank you for those words. We'll now move into what has become an anthem of sorts, Welcome, written and now performed by Mark Miller. Mark. Let's walk together for a while and ask where all of us are welcome here all are welcome in this place let's talk together place you're invited to come 
come and know God's grace. All our welcome, the love of God to share. Cause all of us are welcome here. All are welcome in this place. Let me sing the last verse. Let's dream together of the day when earth and heaven are one. A city built of love and light, the new Jerusalem, where our morning turns to dancing. Every creature lifts its voice, crying, Welcome, welcome to this place. You're invited to come and know God's grace. All are welcome, the love of God to share. Cause all of us are welcome here. Everyone is welcome in this Zoom room. All are welcome in this place. Amen. Mark, thank you so much. Um, Thanks for leading us in that piece that has become, as I said, Andover Newton's anthem in a way, as we have found a new home here. Next up is one of our current trustees, the Reverend Abner Coto Bonilla, and Abner will be reading Psalm 107, an adapted form written by Barbara Gibson. Welcome, Abner. Hi, everyone. Oh, give thanks to the one, for many were redeemed from trouble when they listened and woke up. May it be so for us today. Some wander in desert waits, lost and abandoned, hungry and thirsty for many, fainting from loneliness. May their cries be heard by the one. May they find their way and come into a safe place. Some sit in darkness and pain, prisoners of poverty and hate. Their hearts are broken because when they fail, no one helped them. May they break out of darkness and shatter heavy bonds. Some are sick of body and soul, failing, close to the gates of death. They are ill and in pain, alone, without their friends. May they find deliverance. May their suffering be healed. Some have plumped into addiction, tossed by storms of craving, without strength to resist their bondage. They stagger in confusion and pain. May the storm in their souls be stilled and the waves of guilt be quieted. May they find a safe heaven because of human ignorance and greed, rivers have become deserts and springs of water have dried up. Freightful land has turned into salt flat, but deserts can become pools of water and springs will return to the parched land. The hungry will live in fruitful land again, sowing the fields and planting vineyards. The harvest can be abundant when we follow the ways of the earth rather than our own selfish ways. Bless those who live simply and respect, and respect all creatures. They do not overpopulate the land. They, they build their houses and tend their crops without polluting, polluting the earth. Let those who seek wisdom hear these words. Let all who have suffered know the love of the one. Amen. 
Abner, thank you so much for offering that reading. Psalm 107, again, adapted by Barbara Gibson. Thank you, Abner. Now we'll have an introduction of our speaker by founding Dean Sarah B. Drummond. Welcome, Sarah. Emerge, gather, belong. Those three words comprise Andover Newton's theme for the year, and they also express the movement of the church in the world when that movement is faithful to the gospel. For generations, Andover Newton has educated faith community leaders who enact and embody God's vision of a loving, just, and vibrant world in wide ranging contexts. We don't believe, nor do we teach, that churches are for the members with a committee off to the side thinking about social justice. The upbuilding of natural and human vitality and the work of a Christian community are entirely intertwined. A gospel-centered education for social justice ministry is part of Andover Newton's past, present, and future. Bishop Yvette A. Flunder has devoted her life's work to the unification of gospel and social justice ministries. It's for this reason that we've invited her to be our convocation speaker this year. Bishop Flunder founded the City of Refuge United Church of Christ in 1991. City of Refuge is a thriving inner city congregation that celebrates the radically inclusive love of Jesus Christ. Preaching a message of action, the church has experienced steady numerical and spiritual growth and is now located in the South Market area of San Francisco at 1025 Howard Street. A native San Franciscan, Bishop Flunder is a third generation preacher with roots in the Church of God in Christ. Bishop Flunder is also an ordained minister of the United Church of Christ and a graduate of the Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, California. She received a Doctor of Ministry degree from San Francisco Theological Seminary. In June 2003, Bishop Flunder was consecrated presiding bishop of the fellowship, a multi-denominational fellowship of 110 primarily African-American Christian leaders and laity representing 56 churches and faith-based organizations from all parts of the United States, Mexico, and the continent of Africa. Responding to the needs of the AIDS epidemic, Bishop Flunder and her staff opened Hazard Ashley House and Walker House in Oakland and Restoration, Restoration House in San Francisco through the Ark of Refuge Incorporated, a nonprofit agency which provides housing, direct services, education and training for persons affected by HIV and AIDS in the Bay Area, throughout the USA, and in three countries in Africa. Restoration House is a dual diagnosis residential facility for African-American women and the first of its kind in San Francisco. Bishop Flunder now participates in the life of Andover Newton Seminary at Yale Divinity School as a fellow which is a communion of faith leaders across the nation that provide our seminary with guidance on keeping our curriculum relevant while also providing our students with mentoring. Bishop Flunder, my sibling, my hero, thank you for being with us today. We welcome you in the name of Christ and we are honored by your presence. We're eager to hear the good news that God has placed on your heart to share with us today. Thank you, Bishop Flunder. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that introduction. We are indeed looking forward, Bishop Flunder, to your words. Um, and leading up to them, uh, Mark will come back and lead us in a hymn of preparation. Welcome again, Mark. about me I am a 
child. I am a child of God. No matter what people say, say or think about you, No matter what the world says, says or thinks about me, I am a child, I am a child of God. No matter the church he says decisions pronouncements on you you are a child you are a child of God and there is no thing and no Separate you from the truth that you're someone, you are our family, you are meant to be a child, a child. No matter what people say, you are a child of God. The whole Andover Newton team, for the four of us, Jaquan and myself and Dean Drummond and Tracy are in our offices. And Mark, if you could hear us right now, you would know that we can hear each other singing <laughs> through our walls, even though the doors are closed. Thank you so much for, um, for bringing your uh, gift of music. It is such a treasure. Um, next, we will have our scripture reading from current student Molly Mitchell, who is also the convener of our student steering committee. Welcome, Molly. The walk to Emmaus. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them whose name was Cleopas answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And he asked him, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was 
alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe that all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scriptures. As they came near to the village where they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was walking and talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Thank you so much. Hello, Anover Newton at Yale family. May I just take a, a point of uh, opportunity to say to my sister Sarah Drummond, my brother Mark Miller, to the many, many faces that I both know and are meeting the first time today. Uh, God bless each of you and thank you and the entire faculty, administrative and student body that are a part of our gathering. What a joy, what a joy it is to be with you today. I want to share today from a couple of verses in the book of Luke, the gospel 10th chapter in the 28 through 30 verses. I'm sure that many of us have read this story and know this story. I won't even take the moment and reflect directly on the passage, but rather on the story. And let me preface by saying that it's my joy to represent the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, over 100 leaders, by the way, now who have experienced accredited theological education. Most are people of color who represent and serve in many emerging justice communities and concerns, as you know. And there remains an assumption by some that the spiritual formation that pre-existed our formal theological education should be tossed out. I've heard a lot of folks say that you need to let a lot of that Methabaptocostal stuff go that <laughs> you experienced before coming into these experiences. But I remember, and I want to take time to pay homage to the road laid by the praying women who prayed for me when I was a young girl in the Pentecostal church. And I call their names often, Mother Jessie Mae Gatson, and Mother Virgie Lee Hunter, the old women who led me to Christ and did what they called prayed me through to the Holy Ghost. That's what they called it in the Pentecostal church. They started me on the road to a life of full-time ministry. And every time I get a chance, I wanna lift them up. They were bereft of opportunities of sometimes secondary and tertiary education, but they were people filled with the spirit. And I remember them today. I have come to believe that preparation for ministry must be informed by the state of the road. And by that, I mean the time, the world that we are called to journey in and serve. We are not enrolled here simply for the survival of our schools. 
or the ministerial supply needed for denominations and faith-based organizations. <laughs> we are here to be empowered to impact the state of the road. Our faculty, our advisors, our mentors seek to remain constantly aware of the potential vacuum between our training and the state of the world. And there is a vacuum often between our preparation and the state of the world. And of what value, may I say, is a glut of theologically prepared folks in a world in need of something that our preparation does not address. I wanna say thank you to Andover Newton at Yale for the disruption of a pedagogy that reflects justice disparity. Thank you for doing the hard work that needed to be done to continue as Andover Newton so that we could continue to serve in helping leaders prepare to deal with our time. What of the road? What of our road? What of what we are called to? And I know the struggle for many on the road to authorize ministry. Some of you differently visioned prophets. I know who you are. <laughs> I've interacted with you, differently visioned, consistently get battered on the way, sometimes to denominational authorization. Those of you whose cultural power and experiences are valued. And I say it this way, wherever I go, I'm gonna bring my chitlins. Now, let me just say, if you don't know anything about chitlins, God bless you. If you've ever experienced chitlins, you understand what I'm saying, but I would suggest that you not come into Chitlin's late in life, primarily because you would sort of have to be born <laughs> in an environment where Chitlin's belong. But it is important for me to say that on New Year's, just about every year, if I can find a good Chitlin cook, I'm going to have at least one Chitlin because it is indicative of my history, of the people that raised me. The question is often, can I bring my chitlins to what it is that I am asked to do, both in my training and in my praxis? When I get out there in the world with my training, how much of my own experience can I add to that? And I'll say that as a person of African descent, as a person who was raised by classical Pentecostals, as a same gender loving woman, as a woman who understands what it is to be a woman in the work of ministry full-time. So it begs the question, what if the road we are called to travel takes us to destinations completely inconsistent with the model trajectory we have planned for? Recently, I have had conversations with several seminary graduates who have moved into other fields different from what they visioned while training for ministry. One of them studied to be a rabbi, two were studying to be Catholic priests, one was from the Methodist church and one from the church of Christ. And they all had one thing in common. They were disillusioned with organized religion. So much that they did not want to even entertain the thought of entering into ministry as it was prescribed. Each of them had stories to tell about the bright, effervescent visions they had while preparing for ministry life. And others had other stories about how churches and synagogues and their parents and communities and such the like were unwieldy, narrow-minded, and often cruel, such that they gave up the struggle and are now in a variety of interesting political, social work, and philanthropic jobs. Some left that trajectory because they were same gender loving people and could not any longer bear the rejection and hiding. Some left because they detested the politics of church and placement. Some left because they could not bear the absence of real outreach to hurting people in their organizations and denominations. All of them were careful to let everyone they know and everyone they meet know that they are not religious. They had this in common. <laughs> Things like, I am relational, I am spiritual, 
but I am not religious. I'm sure many of you have heard this often these days. But I want to add that these are brilliant people with marvelous people skills and hearts that love people and love God and beautifully seminary trained. They are lights that shine in darkness, but it seems that the darkness comprehends them not. So here's the hard question today. Can organized religion be filled with darkness? Can so-called Christian and other influenced folks, in fact, in our so-called Christian influenced nation, can we be more filled with greed than good? Can mega churches and humongous houses of worship be filled with racism, sexism? I dare say sorrowfully, yes, they can. Each of their religious organizations lost some of their best and brightest because darkness, especially zealous religious darkness, did not, perhaps cannot, comprehend light and cannot comprehend the road. The probing question that I carry in my spirit, beloved, today about the story of the Good Samaritan, familiar story to all of us, is what about the road? What about this road? What about the road spoken of in the gospels? What about the road that so many religious people were traveling on, but so many people were being ambushed and dying on it? What about the road? A few years back, I was listening to Tavis Smiley. Some of you all may know Tavis Smiley, who had a town hall meeting with African-American clergy one of the guest panelists was the late Dr. James Cone, whom I respect highly as a father of Black liberation theology. Tavis asked Dr. Cone what he thought about the phenomena of mega churches in the African-American community and about the preaching of prosperity gospel in these churches. And Dr. Cone responded in that way that he could. He's about the same height as me in that high voice and he put his finger on his chin. And he said that preaching prosperity for prosperity's sake or preaching that monetary success is an indicator of the blessing of God is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, rather, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of failure out of which God brings God ordains success. These words transformed me because by the standards of how this present religious darkness can view success. Jesus was a complete failure. Let's examine him for a minute. The road of religion was dangerous for Jesus. He was born in the projects, <laughs> Nazareth, the outline projects. He was born of a teenage mother under dubious circumstances. Let's be clear. I'm sure there were several people that did not believe that the Holy Ghost was the baby's daddy. He was a likely laborer, a carpenter, who was apparently unemployed. He was on the bad side of religion and empire simultaneously. We don't know if he ever got married. We've not been given that opportunity or what kind of love relationships he might have had. We do know he had a bunch of unemployed and barely employed men traveling around with him all the time. He apparently did not own a home. He was labeled subversive. He was arrested. He was tried. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. He was convicted. He was deserted by his friends and he was executed and his family had to bury him in a borrowed tomb. That is not a successful life in today's concept of success. He certainly failed by the standards of the present religious definition of successful and prosperity ministry. Yet he was the light that shines in darkness. 
the darkness comprehended him not. But what the darkness also did not and does not comprehend is the power of resurrection. Hallelujah. Let me have a Pentecostal moment. Hallelujah. How God can take an apparently hopeless dead situation and make dry bones live. How God can recompose the decomposed. And I say to you, my beloved, my family at Andover Newton at Yale, God is calling us currently to recompose the decomposed and to speak life into a time, a clear time of reformation and change. The spirit of God, the quintessential good Samaritan that picks us up from our deadness and feeds us and holds us and pays for our stay while we heal. So here's a difficult question. I would ask you as you hold these truths and visions in your hands and hearts, flush with innovative ideas for successful ministry, flush with innovative ideas to prepare people for successful ministry, to go out into this way too conservative and right-winged environment. How are we willing to spend our time and talent and treasure repairing the road? This is hard work. Shifting and reforming what we now call church and religion. We need some good Samaritans who will walk past the pompous, self-aggrandizing, power-mongering religious folks who left a broken, presumably dead man on the road. Too many are content to leave the road or step over the dead and dying religion. But what we need is some road repairers. I'm calling on you today. Some road repairers, repairers of the breach, as my brother Bishop William Barber calls us, Road repairers. These men on the road to Emmaus couldn't recognize a dying man because they were blinded by the legalisms that they were required to perform. In the story of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus, Mary and Martha were so preoccupied with the finality of Lazarus's death to realize that the resurrection had come to their house. <laughs> And just like their brother Lazarus died and he was quickened by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, God can cause us to live out our vision and our call despite this violent religious environment, violent, political, race-based, religious environment that is trying to take the joy out of our salvation. God can cause you to find your ministry destiny, my beloved, despite your difficult placement procedures. If your place doesn't exist in the denomination or in the organizations that you're a part of, if your place doesn't exist, create one. <laughs> God can choose you to change the road. Faculty, administrators, leaders, presidents, alumni, God can choose us to change the road, to clear the road, to resurface the road, to make safe the road, to widen the road, to get some lights and some stop signs on the road, to clear the potholes from the road, God is using men, women, and children, and gender non-conforming people to change the road. God is using gender variant people to change the road, and God will cause you to live and be true to yourself and what you know and believe. Why, Bishop Flunder? Because light is stronger than darkness. Hallelujah. And truth is greater than error. And love is stronger than death. What of the road, beloved? What of the, beloved, of the road for us, beloved? We are called to be changers and change makers. We are called. We are called to emerge, gather, and belong and call to those 
who the road would kill and say, we are here to repair the breach. God bless you today is my prayer. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Uh, Bishop Funder, I don't know if you can hear them, but the amens are echoing around our office suite. Thank you so much for this word. We give thanks to you for, for bringing this word to us today. Thank you. Uh, hallelujah indeed. Um, Mark Miller will now lead us in a hymn of response. Mark, it's all you. It's a little sticky. Let's see. Uh, emerge and gather. We'll rebuild together. And uh, we'll understand it farther along. Oh, farther along. We'll know all about. Come on, brother Greg Moley. Farther along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, cheer up, my kinfolk. Yes, live in the sunshine. We'll understand. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark. We will now uh, move into a time of prayer with Professor Gregory Mobley. Welcome, Greg. Hello, and uh, this is addressed to Mark Miller and everyone else. Let us pray. Spirit whose presence sends autumn chills up and down our spines. Artist with brown, red, orange, and gold who paints on a canvas of leaves. Scheduler of harvest moon. We praise you in this and every season. Receive our autumn song. We thank you for all we harvest in the fall, for apples sweet, pumpkins mild, cranberries tart. We thank you for last leaves and first frost. As the hours of daylight grow shorter, we cherish even more the glow of your grace. As the hours of daylight grow shorter, we cherish even more encounters with your warm love that relieves our loneliness. With the stilling of the buzz of this season's crickets, help us hear the new life you shelter in silence until it's time. Take us safely through winter till we bloom and buzz again by your loving kindness. Great God, 
pull all of us and all things closer together, even as each retains its own beauty and clarity in imitation of the mystery of the Trinity. Three and one, in whose name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Greg. It's now time, friends, to gather your communion elements, if you have them. And we will be led in communion by Professor S. Mark Heim, Andover Newton graduate MDiv 76, and Andover Newton and Boston College PhD graduate 78, and the Reverend Tamara Moreland, YDS MDiv 01, and current and newest, we're happy to say, Andover Newton trustee. Thank you, Reverend Moreland and Professor Heim for leading us in this time of communion. Welcome. Thank you. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for our service of communion. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You who come to me shall not hunger and you who believe in me shall never thirst. This is the Lord's table. Our savior invites us to come in trust, to share the feast here prepared for us. Eternal God, who has created the heavens and earth, giving breath to every living thing, we thank you for all the gifts of creation and for the gift of life itself. We thank you for making us in your own image and we rejoice in Jesus Christ, the only one eternally begotten by you. Now, O oh God, let us hold no offense against our brother or sister and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, whether it be thought, word, or deed, that we partake in this sacred meal worthily. And in this meal, we remember Christ's death we celebrate Christ's resurrection and we await Christ's return. Gathered as we are together, we recall anew these words and acts of Jesus Christ. As Jesus was with his disciples, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat, my body broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. Ministering with you in Christ's spirit, I offer you this bread, take and eat. And in like manner, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. I share with you the cup. Let us pray together. We give thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. And so let us, in this time of communion, reciting the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. And we have a more traditional version, but please pray the version that suits you and that you appreciate. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And God bless you. And God bless you, Mark and Tamara. Thank you for leading us in this time of communion. And now we will have the extinguishing of the chalice uh, offered by Dr. Nancy Neenhaus, who has shined light in so many of our lives. Um, Nancy, thank you for the, doing this. Nancy is also a current trustee with us at Andover Newton. Welcome, Nancy. It's great to be with you all. We extinguish this chalice, but not our desire to create peace, enact justice, and embody love. These we will do with all our heart on every road we travel and repair. May it be so. May it be so. Thank you, Nancy. For all of you who helped lead this worship, I give thanks to God and thanks to you for leading us through this time and shining light. We built some roads here today. We fixed some potholes and I am so grateful for each one of you. And for those of you who tuned in and are watching or are watching a recording of this, we give thanks for you as well. Thank you so much for being a part of this extended community and joining us during this time of worship. And if you're interested in continuing along on the Andover Newton convocation journey along this road we're on this week, there's still time to register for the three workshops that are on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Friends, hear these words of benediction before we hear the postlude from Mark. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you and show you mercy and grace. And may God's presence, which is with already within you, go before you on the road from this day forward forever in peace. Peace, friends. Amen. Mark, it's all yours. Take it away. You taught my heart what love can be. So, let's see what I got here. <laughs> you taught my heart what love can be. So I'm headed back home by another road. I once was bound. But now I'm free, so I'm headed back home by another
headed back home by another road. Yes, we're headed back home by another road. We are headed by another road. Yes, we're headed back home by another road.